consult Prince Edward County at all, I will tell you it was much more convenient for me than to have to work in the old courthouse here. As hospitable as those people were, I had access to the records in Virginia at the old library, the old state library. Now, the story begins with this fellow, Richard Randolph. And the first document I saw, in fact, was not my discovery. It had been published before, and that's Richard Randolph's will. And Randolph's will is familiar to some of you, I'm sure, because it's only partly a will. It is largely an abolitionist tract. It's his thoughts about what slavery really is. Now, I need to tell you about Richard Randolph, a couple of things you may already know that are very unusual. The first is that when he sat down to write this will, he was only 26 years old. That's something that not many 26-year-olds do. There's no evidence that he was terminally ill. We don't know why he wrote the will at 26, but he did. He was already famous at the time he wrote the will. He was famous. Of course, he lived right across the Appomattox River from here on the Bizarre Plantation. He was famous for having been accused of getting his sister-in-law pregnant and helping her abort the fetus or kill the newborn child. Now, we know today that he did neither of those things, but he was reputed to have done it at the time, and he defended himself against that charge in Cumberland County Court and was never, in fact, indicted. But he had a clown hanging over his head for the last three years of his life. Then he writes this will, I think for reasons having nothing to do with the scandal. And the will is the most remarkable anti-slavery document I think I've seen, and I've read Frederick Douglass and I've read William Lloyd Garrison. Let me read you a sentence and a half of what this Virginia planter said about slavery in 1796. Now, I say a sentence and a half, but the first sentence is very long, as was the custom in those days. Richard writes, With an indignation too great for utterance at the tyrants of the earth, from the throned despot of a whole nation to the more despicable but not less infamous petty tormentor of single wretched slaves, whose torture constitutes his wealth and enjoyment, I do hereby declare that it is my will and desire, nay, my most anxious wish, that my negroes, all of them, be liberated. I thus yield them up their liberty, basely wrested from them by my forefathers, and beg, humbly beg, their forgiveness for the manifold injuries I have too often inhumanly, unjustly, and mercilessly inflicted on them. Well, that's pretty powerful stuff. I should say a couple more things about the Randolphs, though. First of all, Richard had acquired his slaves by inheritance. He had inherited some 150 slaves from his father. He hadn't acquired them on purpose and was not able to liberate most of them at the time he wrote this will because all but five of them had been mortgaged by his father. You could mortgage a slave in those days just as you can mortgage a house today. And until those mortgages were paid off, these enslaved people could not be liberated. So really what Randolph was asking is that his soon-to-be widow, as it turned out, Judith, pay off these mortgages and put herself eventually in a position to liberate these slaves and give them land. And I'll talk about that story in a minute. Right now I'll only say that it took 14 years before the liberation took place in 1810 that tragically almost half of the Randolph slaves had to be sold off to make money to keep the creditors at bay until the other slaves could be liberated. So half the group pays through perpetual bondage for the perpetual freedom of the other half. And that's one of the ironies of this story. The liberation did take place in 1810. The grant of land was made. The land was two miles west of here on this road, just beyond the railroad trestle, that hill that rises off to the left. The newly freed slaves, who at that time no 
place, this hill, two miles west of here, was the promised land, and they named it Israel Hill. Now let me backtrack for a minute and say, let's, let's move back to the archives, because I said I saw one document, Richard Randolph's will. I saw two more documents that day, the first day that I began researching this topic. The second document was an article, a short article, written in 1836 by Colonel James Madison of Farmville. Not, of course, the form, former president, but a, a distant relative of his. Madison, in fact, eventually bought the plantation right next to Israel Hill. There's that low land between that hill and the Appomattox River. Madison acquired it. And Madison wrote an article published in the Farmer's Register in which he said that in the course of one generation, the free blacks of Israel Hill had degenerated into idlers, thieves, and prostitutes. Now, it was clear to me that this was pro-slavery propaganda. It was clear to me that this man was saying this in order to justify slavery, as if to say the only proper condition for African Americans was to be under the control of whites. Once they were on their own, they were bound to fail. And yet, it seemed to me entirely possible that the community would have failed, because I knew that they would have been up against some pretty serious odds. The third document, and the last document that I saw that day, was in fact about two sentences quoted in Bradshaw's Big Thick History of Prince Edward County, which some of you are familiar with, from a memoir written in 1906 by a white resident of Prince Edward remembering antebellum times. And this man remembered Israel Hill as a thriving place, prolific, as he said, of many good free Negroes. And then he started listing free blacks by name who had lived there and who had become well-respected citizens by black and white alike. Well, I knew that there was a heck of a story here. And in fact, there were several competing stories of what happened to these ex-Randolph slaves, and I wanted to find out, I thought, what the real story was. Let me tell you what I found out. First of all, I'll tell you what you already know, and that is what a freed person of African descent in 1810 would have been up against. Virginia at that time, of course, was a society in which if you were free but black, you couldn't vote, you couldn't serve on a jury, you couldn't testify against a white defendant in a court of law. You were at least supposed to carry papers with you at all times documenting your free status. Or, again, in theory, you could be re-enslaved. And there were years in which free black people had to pay taxes in Virginia that white people weren't subjected to. And then, of course, you lived in a society in which the operating assumption of most white people was that slavery was the appropriate condition for people of African descent. And this article by Colonel James Madison is a perfect example of that attitude. Now, the question that I had in my mind was, against those odds, what could a person, in fact, achieve? And this book becomes, in no small part, a narrative of what people achieved. Free African Americans had several very important rights. One of those rights was the right to buy, hold, sell, and bequeath property. And by property, I mean real estate, I mean land, I mean buildings, and, of course, personal property. And what these people did was really quite remarkable, some of them anyway. The first settler of Israel Hill, the first free black settler, was a man, I think, very appropriately named Hercules White. I think Hercules is appropriate because this fellow seems to have worked about 18 or 20 hours a day at all kinds of things. He was a carpenter, he was a cooper, he was a farmer, he hauled cargo 
elsewhere and they were doing the same sorts of things the other species of property that i want to talk about tonight the blacks acquired is one that's fascinating to me that some of you know about already and that's the appomattox river plateau it's hard to picture as we look on this stream uh this couple of stones throw from here that there was a time when there was a fleet of 40 boats that regularly ran up and down the uh, appomattox between farmville and petersburg the appomattox river bateau was a remarkable craft it was 50 to 60 feet long which is to say at least from where i'm standing to the back of this room maybe a little longer and only six feet wide from here to the to uh, that chair a little actually uh, narrower than that in this boat well let me say this boat was propelled on the river by two men with poles some of you know this there'd be a man on each side with a pole pushing on the river bottom there'd be a captain or head man in the stern uh, steering with a steering oar you could load a an Appomattox River bateau with five to seven tons of cargo. Downstream, that would be tobacco or wheat or sometimes already ground flour. Coming back from Petersburg, it would be mercantile goods to be sold in the stores up here. A hundred miles each way as the river meanders. You could put five to seven tons of cargo in this boat and float it in two feet of water. In a pinch, you could float it in 20 inches of water. That's how finely designed these boats were. And boating in old Prince Edward County was a biracial profession. There were white men, enslaved black men, and free black men, all of them running boats on the river. But in the years after Reconstruction, when white people reminisced about boating on the Appomattox River, they remembered it as a black occupation. That's how prominent the the blacks of Israel Hill had, had become, that the white boatmen were a, a sort of forgotten breed at that point. So blacks actually not only ran boats up and down the river, but they purchased boats and in, in effect opened up uh, cargo, uh, business, shipping businesses that ran up and down the Appomattox River and again acquired uh, prosperity that way, many of them. Now the other thing that free blacks could do in old Prince Edward that I wasn't prepared for and should have probably been is that they could file civil lawsuits even against white people. And I find them doing it uh, fairly frequently. There's an idea that in the old South, if a white committed some kind of aggression or assault on a free black, that the, that the black had no recourse. Well, I found 18 or 19 cases in Prince Edward alone where a free black man or woman actually went before the county court and, and sued a white person for assault. And in three or four of those cases, the, uh, the black uh, uh, plaintiff actually won his or her suit, which is interesting because, of course, the court, the county court was all white, the juries were all white, and yet, at least at times, a black person could get a hearing there. Black folk also sued whites over unpaid debts and other, other sorts of disputes. Two examples. There was a man named Syfax Brown. Syfax Brown had been Richard Randolph's personal valet. And our stereotype of the house servant is of somebody who was, in fact, subservient to the master, uh, did the master's bidding, was not uh, someone prepared to stand up for himself. Well, Syfax Brown, this ex-butler, was very assertive. He became a free man. He started running a herd of hogs. His hogs wandered into the garden of a white neighbor named Bennett. And Bennett, not being uh, one for subtle persuasion, laid hold of a gun and shot the hogs. What is a black man going to do in 1809 in a situation like that? Well, Syfax Brown didn't hesitate. He went to the county court, filed suit, and won a monetary judgment 
whites and blacks pooled their funds in order to transport cargo on the river, for example, or for other purposes. They sued each other. I found black and white men working side by side in the wheat harvest in this county year in and year out, both making the same wages, a dollar a day, which was great money back then. It was double the usual wage. I found that the congregation that we now call Farm Bill Baptist Church, which is another few stones throw from here, was founded in 1836 by a white pastor, but the first two members, founding members, were none other than Sam and Phil White, free blacks of Israel Hill, and the church records chronicle this. Sam and Phil White were quickly joined by about two dozen fairly prominent white people who apparently thought nothing strange about joining a church whose founding members were black. I found a newly freed African-American woman who, with her family, hitched up a wagon, along with their white neighboring family, who also hitched up their wagon, and both families moved west of Kentucky together, together every mile of the way, settled in the same town, and stayed in touch with each other after they got there. I found at least six long-term marriages in which the husband was a man of color and the wife was white. One of these was a church marriage in 1786 in which the white father gave his written permission for the marriage to take place, and the couple bought a farm next to his, settled down next to the white parents of the bride, and named one of their children after the white father-in-law, without anybody apparently batting an eye. The other five cases I can document happened when it was against the law to marry somebody of a different race. So these are people who settled down together and remained together. Sometimes I can trace the children and the grandchildren. Now this is a good time for me to point out that not all was sweetness and light in old Prince Edward County. I know about these five marriages because some white person or persons went before the grand jury and complained about them. So there was a body of white opinion out there that was not happy about the amount of freedom that free blacks actually had, but in none of the five cases did the county authorities actually do anything. Nobody was brought to trial, much less convicted. None of the couples that I can find were broken up. So the majority of white people seem to have taken a kind of live and live, let live attitude. Not the attitude that the races should be equal, but that you didn't need to grind free blacks down into the dust, that they were already civilly disabled and you didn't need to interfere with them beyond that. Now how could it be? Why would it be that people of the black and white race could actually cooperate under a system that after all was based on one race exploiting another on grounds of color? Let me suggest a couple of reasons. First of all, numbers. Let's talk about numbers for a minute. In this county, in the generation before the Civil War, something like 12 out of every 13 black residents was a slave. So the fraction that were free was a relatively small fraction, and I don't think that most white people viewed that fraction as an immediate physical threat. But I should say on the other hand, that of every 10 free people in this county, one was black. So we're not talking about a trivial population of people either. But I want to talk mainly about positive reasons why black and white could find things in common. And I want to talk about the cultures. The cultures of black people and white people in old Prince Edward County were different, but not as different as we may think. Let's talk about the church 
service, going into the church and breaking up the service, defacing church buildings, threatening the minister with a tree limb in one case. And suddenly I realized that if you're a devout white Baptist, to whom are you going to feel a greater kinship? The devout black Baptist sitting in the same sanctuary with you, or that hoodlum outside who shares your color but doesn't share your values and your religious conviction? Obviously the black and white Baptists have far more in common than the white Baptist and the white hoodlum. You could say the same thing when it came to business. People in the North think that there was no work ethic in the Old South because slaves had no good reason to want to work and whites thought that work was the province of slaves. Well, you don't have to dig very far to find out there was a work ethic in the Old South. The people who had prestige in Farmville, Virginia, and I can abundantly document this, were people who were industrious, who knew how to make money, hold money, invest money, and make more money. That was esteemed here. And there were white folks who knew how to do that, and there were black folks who knew how to do that. And the whites and the blacks who knew how to defer gratification, knew how to save money, knew how to invest, knew how to reap a profit, did business with each other all the time, and they had that in common. Now this is before we talk about things like language and naming practices, which I want to speak about just for a minute. It was surprising to me how similar the English language, as spoken by whites in Old Prince Edward, was to the English spoken by blacks. How do I know how people spoke? Well, there were a lot of people in this county, some of them very prominent, some of them office holders, who had just enough schooling to where they would put pen to paper, but not enough that they knew the spelling rules. So they would write the English language the way they spoke it. They'd write it phonetically. And I've got hundreds of documents that allow me to reconstruct white English in Old Prince Edward County. And what you'll find, let me just give you an example. This is drawn from actual documents. Let's picture a crew of carpenters building a bridge in Old Prince Edward County. And the master carpenter is working on an abutment, and he needs some more boards to build it with. What he says to his assistant is going to sound something like this. I can't build no abutment without you giving me some more of them boats. That's white English in Old Prince Edward County. And it's not identical to black English, but it's fairly close. Now, that was interesting to me because my first book, and here it is, had been about the Amos and Andy radio and television shows. And so I knew as well or better than most that in the 20th century, one of the ways that whites labeled blacks as different was by caricaturing the way blacks supposedly spoke English. Well, that would have been much, much harder to do in Old Virginia because white folk spoke so similarly to the way blacks did. Another way in the 20th century that people stereotyped blacks was that they would attribute strange names to blacks. For example, in Amos and Andy, I wonder if anybody remembers what the name of the lawyer character was. Calhoun. Calhoun. Do you remember what his first name was? Algonquin J. Calhoun. And if you read humorous literature by whites about black characters from the first half of the 20th century, almost all the characters, the black characters, have these odd names like Poppy Smash and Algonquin J. and so forth. So I paid a lot of attention to the names that people gave their children in Old Prince Edward County. And what I found was that the names that white people, including prominent white people, gave to their children were no less exotic sounding to us than the names that blacks used. Let me read you a very short list of names of white men in Old Prince Edward 
Augustus, Caesar, Achilles. I could go on and on. These are names not of slaves, but of white men whose mothers and fathers chose those names for them. You find women, white women named Blizzard, Demarius, Messenia, Morning with a U, Camellia, Marie Antoinette, Magdalene, Masura, Ketura, and the name Jemima, which we associate with a pancake syrup, was actually more popular among whites than it was among blacks. So here too, the cultures of the two races <coughs> were far uh, closer together in old Prince Edward than people of our time uh, think that they were. Now, before this starts to sound as if we have, we're talking about a society in which uh, everybody was enlightened and people got along and there was no oppression, uh, I have to remind you of a couple of things. I already talked about all the uh, disadvantages that free blacks faced, and this is even before we talk about what slavery uh, was really like. I thought I knew a lot about slavery uh, before I started this project. I didn't know the half of it. I came to understand the wisdom of a remark that a colleague of mine once made, which is that when you research slavery, there are times when you feel that you just need to get up from that table in the archives reading room and go outside and breathe some clean air because you just can't believe what you're reading. Slaves changed hands as gifts, as payments of gambling debts. Uh, slaves as, as young as four, five, six, taken away from their mothers. People don't believe that, uh, but, it's, but it's true. I found a coroner's inquest over the dead body of a slave named Robin in this county, not long, not long before the Civil War. Now you may know that in those times, a coroner's inquest worked in the following way. The county coroner would assemble a jury of 12 laymen, not doctors, and all 13 of them would look at the, at the dead body in question and try to figure out what had happened. So these 13 white men looked at the body of Robin and they found the body essentially was mutilated. The man's back was 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 lacerated by whips. There were there, there were there were other uh, other forms of damage on the body, which the the jury described very very frankly and vividly. But they weren't prepared to say that this was a homicide. Why not? Well, I'll quote you the reason that they gave. They said we have seen many Negroes worse whipped than we thought Robin had been, and they are still living. So when my students asked me, was whipping widespread and severe in the Old South, I show them that document, because far be it from me to say, I'll let the people who were alive back then say, and they say quite frankly, it was commonplace, and it could be very, very severe. In Buckingham Courthouse, let me, let me preface this by saying that uh, I'm, I'm not trying to say that masters of slaves typically went out of their way to be cruel. What I'm saying is that this was a system that was, was, was cruel by its nature. Frederick Douglass tells us, and he's right about this, that one of the most dreaded things in the life of a slave was when the master died or went bankrupt. Because when that happened, the slaves could be scattered to the four winds. If a slave owner went bankrupt, his or her property would be seized by the court and auctioned off by the sheriff to make good on those debts. And of course, the two main kinds of property in that society were land and slaves. So back to Buckingham Courthouse, 1842. 1842 was a, a, a bad year. There was a depression that started in 1837, and it lasted in this part of the world for about eight years. In 1842, there was a sheriff's sale of confiscated property in Buckingham Courthouse that lasted for two solid days in which 120 human beings were sold. I'm quite sure many of them were slave traders taking them down to the Gulf states. And many of them, I'm quoting from an eyewitness, many of them boys and girls. And this was not because anybody wanted to do it, it was because the system was such that this is what happened as a commonplace thing. The great road from Baltimore and Richmond to the Gulf states ran across the, the breadth of this county. And we know that on any given day, you could find uh, groups of 
40 male slaves shackled to a central chain, if they were very lucky, accompanied by their wives and children, but maybe not, being driven by slave traders down that road to be sold in the Gulf states. Where do I stop? I'll give one more example. The wealthiest man in Prince Edward County at the outbreak of the Civil War was known as a barbaric master of slaves. But the full story didn't come out until this man, and I'm not naming him because I'm not trying to embarrass anybody, until this man was killed by one of his slaves. The slave went on trial, and there was a parade of witnesses, slaves and whites, all saying the same thing, which is that the master had been a well-known brute, that the master had habitually beaten the slave with a rod from head to toe, had gouged his eyes, had chained this slave to the floor while he slept at night, had pulled teeth out of the slave's mouth as a form of, I don't know whether you'd call that punishment or torture, had put shackles on this enslaved man and sent him out in the field to harvest. And even then, even then, the enslaved man was prepared to do his duty. He was quoted by witnesses saying, all I want to do is to cut my row like a man, but I cannot see to wet my blade, because his eyes were so damaged he couldn't see to sharpen the blade with which he was harvesting. When this slave, carrying 10 or 15 pounds of iron, couldn't keep up with the other slaves, the master beat him again, and at that point the slave snapped, took his harvesting tool, and basically amputated the master's leg, from which the master died three weeks later. Now, I've not come here to sensationalize anything. What I'm trying to do is to talk about the fact that this was a society that was capable of great human sympathy and great human cruelty. And I want to say in closing that when I talk of the horrors of slavery, I'm talking about something that darkened the lives even of free people. Let me conclude with two examples. The first is a free black miller named Phil Bowman. Phil Bowman married an enslaved woman named Prissy. This is in the 1810s. Prissy's master went bankrupt in the early 1820s. Sure enough, his property was put at auction by the sheriff. Phil Bowman actually had to attend an auction and bid to buy his own wife and keep her out of the hands of slave traders. Phil Bowman got the money to do that through a loan from his white employer. The white employer was sympathetic, gave Phil a loan, and Bowman paid the loan back over the ensuing months and years out of his wages. So there's a kind of happy ending there. But my final story doesn't have such a happy ending. It concerns Tony White, a free black man of Israel Hill, son of Hercules White, whom I talked about before. Tony White married also an enslaved woman named Millie. He eventually managed to purchase her freedom, but in the meantime they had had five children. Now who can see where this story is going? What am I about to say about the five children? They were slaves because they were born to an enslaved woman. Now I have to assume that Tony and Millie White wanted to buy those children out of slavery. What I don't know is whether they couldn't come up with the money in time or whether the masters didn't want to sell, which of course the masters didn't have to do. In any event, I can tell you that the saddest document that I read in 12 years of research was Tony White's first will, in which he's trying to provide for his widow and for these five children. By the time he wrote that will, around 1850, the five children, by one means or another, had been parceled out among three separate masters. One of those masters had taken three of Tony and Millie's children to Missouri. It says so in the will. I'm as sure as I'm standing here that Tony and Millie White never saw those children again. Beyond 
dictated was not a legally valid will. Why not? Anybody have a guess? Who was he leaving his property to? Slaves. Slaves. And under the law, you could not leave property to property. The law didn't recognize. Now, slaves did possess personal property de facto on an informal basis. But under the law, they didn't have a leg to stand on to defend their ownership of the property. So Tony White could not leave property to property, which is exactly what his children were. And when I speak of Tony White's first will, it's because then White had to write a second will, which would be legally valid. And that meant that he had to find a beneficiary who was a free person. And that's what he ended up doing. So my whole challenge, and at times it feels like walking a tightrope, is to describe a society in which the intimacy between white and black knew no limits. I mean, people could be just as intimate as you can imagine across the color line. People lived physically like this. The idea of physical segregation would have been absurd in the Old South because slavery not only allowed, but it required black and white to be in constant contact. So there's that aspect. And yet at the same time, I have to remind people and inform people of how horrible the horrors could be. This was a society that contained both of those elements. And if you leave one element or the other out, you don't have a valid picture of the society. So this is what I've tried to do in the book. This is what I've tried to do tonight. And I'll thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. And of course, my favorite part of these presentations is the part that begins now, which is when people add comments or ask questions. Bob. Okay. Dr. Ely, on the day that 1810 pops up a lot, and there seems to be two things that I have a question about with that date. Are we using 1810 as the date for about the time of Israel Hill's establishment? Yes. The freeing of the slaves apparently happened at Christmastime 1810 and the settling of the Hill. Most of the families were there by early spring of 1811 because they appear on the free Negro list for 1811 residing up there. All right. Well, my question about it is if there was that law of 1810 that says all free black have to leave the state, how could this have even been allowed to happen unless it was trying to be done to beat the law? Or is it like a lot of laws, they only enforce them when they want to? Right. Well, the short answer to your question is that last thing that you said. But let me expand on it just this much. The story that I tell in the book is largely a story about the two different levels on which whites in old Virginia are related to free blacks. There's the level of abstraction. And if you look at the law codes, you'll see that the laws against free blacks were strict and they got stricter and more numerous by the years. And if you look at the political debate, if you look at the newspapers, you'll see that a lot of whites were very worried about the free black population because they might entice slaves to rebel, because they might set an example of freedom that slaves would want to emulate, that free blacks were troublemakers. 
renew their registration with the county court every three years. I haven't found one individual who did that. Not one. And I find individuals who wait 30, 40, 50 years before they renew the registration. And in most cases, nobody gave them trouble about it. Now, Bob raises the law of 1806, which said that any newly freed black after 1806 had to leave the state within one year. That's why you'll find a free black husband buying a wife out of slavery and not freeing her. He's afraid if he frees her, she may be kicked out of the state. So he keeps her technically as his spouse. Now, the fact is, almost nobody was ever expelled under that law. But it could happen. And there were times when whites got antsy and cracked down a little bit. I wonder if anybody can guess what one event in antebellum history got whites the most anxious about. Nat Turner. The Nat Turner Rebellion. Exactly. Nat Turner led a slave rebellion in 1831 in which 55 or 60 whites were killed. Let me tell you what the response was in Prince Edward County. A major of militia named John Rice reported to his colonel, Asa Dupee, and some of you have heard of him. Rice said that he had noticed that there were groups of blacks loitering on the streets of Farmville. This is after the Turner Rebellion, a short time after. And he, Rice, was worried about this. Dupee wasn't worried. He didn't see a problem. But he wrote to the governor and said, well, my major is worried about these blacks. And there's this group of them that lives up on the hill. But I don't think it's a problem. Time passes. Weeks pass. The county court finally decides, well, we better do something to enhance security after this slave rebellion. And they decide, OK, let's confiscate any weapons owned by free blacks in Prince Edward County. Well, nothing is then done. The county had, I think, two constables. Neither one of them took any action. Finally, one of the county court justices gets so impatient, he goes to one of the constables and says, doggone it, I want you to go collect some guns. The constable reluctantly collects about 10 or a dozen guns. About half of them are not in working order. He finds that one free black gun is in the possession of a white neighbor whom he lent it to. One white neighbor has lent her gun to a free black neighbor in whose possession it now is. So in other words, in the neighborhood, white and black are both using guns and nobody's worried about it. So they take these half dozen guns. More weeks pass. And then the county court decides, well, what are we going to do with these guns? And the decision is made, let's auction them off. Now, I wonder who can guess what they did with the proceeds of the auction. Somebody who hasn't read my book. Any guess? They gave the money to the blacks that the guns had been taken away from. And this way, the county court had its cake and ate it too. Because they could say to whites who were worried about security, well, look, we did our job and we took those guns away. But they could also say to themselves, well, we're men of justice because we didn't just confiscate the guns. We compensated the black citizens for the guns that we took. Perfect example, I think, of the interaction between law and reality. You know, the law was very, very harsh and at times was enforced. Most of the time, things were more laid back and the law was overlooked. Except the law that said blacks couldn't vote or serve on juries or couldn't testify against whites. Those laws were never violated. But that's my long answer to your very succinct question. Excellent. Well, the other thing I would say about your work, what it convinced me of, was the czar was burnt to the ground by these slaves when she went to church that day because they were tired of waiting for their freedom and seeing half of them get sold off for Syphax and Hercules and their bunch to have freedom over across the river. I'm convinced they burn it to the ground because without the house, what do you have? There's no place for Massa to be. But by the same token, 
Well, she may have had. We don't really know because there's no list of who was set free. Correct. There's no list. All we know is that in 1810 she set a bunch free, and we know which ones ended up up here because we have their names on the free black list. But your guess is as good as mine as to what happened to that house. But we know. I mean, what I'll say that backs up your idea is that these slaves had a history of resistance because there had been a mass protest by the Randolph slaves. I think it was 1803. They went next door to Creed Taylor's plantation, Creed Taylor being one of the great legal geniuses of the day. And they said, well, we were promised freedom in 1796. It's now 1803, and we haven't got it. We want to be set free. Rewind to 1787 before Richard Randolph owned any slaves. That same group of slaves at Bazaar had staged a mass strike because there was a cruel overseer over there, and they just quit working, and they vanished to the four winds. One of those slaves got on a horse and rode 80 miles east to where Fanny Randolph, the wife of the owner of Bazaar, was and said, look, the slaves have left, and they're not going to come back unless you establish justice on this plantation. Fanny Randolph gets in some kind of conveyance, comes out here to Cumberland County, I think fires the overseer, and reforms the way the plantation is run. So you're right. There's a tradition here of these black folks resisting what they saw as an injustice, and they definitely saw it as an injustice to be promised freedom to wait 14 years while, as you say, half of their number were sold off. They were worried that the same thing was going to happen to them. You're right. Was there a question when the fire was? When was this, 1813? 1813. Yeah, that's right. And Judy died in 1816. That's right. The fire is 1813, and her death is 1816. And by the way, that's one interesting thing about the Randolphs. Somebody wrote a review of this book and said, well, yeah, it's amazing what the free blacks of Prince Edward County did, what they did on Israel Hill, but they probably managed to do it because they had these influential friends, the Randolphs, looking out for them. Well, the problem with that is that Richard Randolph died in 1796. One of his sons died as a child. His widow died in 1816, five years after Israel Hill was created, and the second son went 
three blacks were second or third class citizens who at the same time managed to rise above that and to win a fair amount of respect in the eyes of whites. I do not think I'm... If this story were unique, I think it would still be worth telling, but it would be far less significant. And I hope it's significant, of course. The last time I went up by Pearl Hartwell's home, it looked like it was really run down. Someone said that someone had moved back that man and improved his job. I can't tell. I was up here the 1st of February, and there was a bunch of... We're talking about the one older house that's still up on the hill. It's just before you get to the water tower there, a late 19th century house. When I was here the 1st of February, there was a bunch of furniture stored on the front porch. And then the next time I was here, it was gone. So does that mean somebody's moving back in? I hope so. Because when I interviewed Ms. Hartwell there in that house in 19... See, that's what happens when you're a historian. You feel like you were living back then. In 1989, I interviewed her in that house, and it was in impeccable shape, and it was neat as a pin. And then I watched it over the years sort of decline, and I would love to see it rehabbed. But I don't know. I think you probably know more about it than I do, really. Any locations there that would be prime archaeological sites? You know, I've asked myself that many times, and I'm such an ignoramus about archaeology that I don't know. I think that if you had the manpower and the womanpower and the expertise, you could find things. I figure if they could find the fort, if they could find James Fort at Jamestown after 400 years, that they could find foundations on Israel Hill after 80 or 100 years. It's just that I don't know how to do it, and I don't have the crew to do it. But I'd love to know. I'd love to be able to put together a map of the place and where all the little buildings are and so forth. We don't have them. Were you able to visit the cemetery that you learned about when you spoke at Longwood? One of the gentlemen there spoke of a cemetery that was near the railroad track. I looked for that a little bit. I didn't have time to sort of beat the bushes, literally beat the bushes, but I looked some and I couldn't find it. I would need to go there with him, I think, because I couldn't follow his description. You seem to be quite sure that he knew of a location. Oh, I was dead certain. I was convinced by what he said. But the only cemetery that I know for sure is the one that's right off of Business 460 behind what I guess was a gas station at one point, a little bit shy of the railroad track, but there's an old, overgrown cemetery with very few markers in it, and I'm told that that's the cemetery of the family named White, as in Hercules. Ma'am, Jack Osborne right here, he's got a copy of it for you tonight. I'll give it to you, a copy. It's right across from Grant's Glass, and it's right beside an alley that goes back to about an 1800 house. It is part of the White, just like you were talking about. Okay. Well, Mr. Osborne, if I had spotted you in this dark room, I would not have attempted to ask the question. I would have bounced it straight to you to begin with, because this man knows more than I'll ever know about the physical layout of Israel Hill. Well, there's a Thomas White, and he was 74 years old when they buried him in 30, and it's about 15 or 20 tombstones there. It may have been a church somewhere there. Yeah, what I'm told is that on Israel Hill, there wasn't exactly a church, but there was a one-room county schoolhouse on Israel Hill, and that they did have Sunday school in that building. When they went to religious worship, they would either come down to First Baptist or to Mount Moriah, but the Sunday school was right up there on the hill. Yes, sir. Oh, they still study architecture? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Osborne. Thank you, Mr. Osborne.
it is a uh, particular honor today to uh, introduce Dr. Melvin Patrick Ely, who is a member of the faculty of the College of William and Mary in the Department of History. Other people are not in the middle, but not in the middle. He is currently the William R. Keenan Jr. Professor of Humanities. Professor Ely grew up in Richmond. He earned his BA in, at Princeton University with study in history, a master's degree in linguistics from the University of Texas in Austin, and a PhD from Princeton University. He has taught at Hebrew University and Yale University prior to joining the faculty of the College of William and Mary in 1995. While at Yale, he received both the Prize for Outstanding Scholarly Publication and Research and the Prize for Teaching Excellence. After coming to the College of William and Mary in 2006, the Governor of Virginia presented to him the Commonwealth's Outstanding Faculty Award. The book about which he will be speaking today, Israel on the Appomattox, has one, the Bancroft Award, which is presented by the faculty of Columbia University for an outstanding work in uh, diplomatic history or history of the United States. And he was also um, named as a editor's choice on the New York Times Book Review and Atlantic Magazine. Um, New York Times Book Review and Atlantic Magazine. So he comes to us with a great deal of um, appreciation and acclaim for the work that he has done. In his work, he has explored the American South and the role of African Americans in American culture. In an earlier work, The Adventures of Amos and Andy, A Social History of an American Phenomenon, he traced, for example, ways in which radio and television portray the relationship of the races in this country. It is with honor that I uh, present him today to speak to us and share his thoughts on Israel, on the Appomattox. Professor Ewing. Well, thank you very much for that uh, gracious introduction. Uh, I want to thank my friend uh, Besada White, uh, who uh, is the person responsible for my being here. If this goes well, she gets all the credit. If it doesn't go well, she had nothing to do with it. I'm going to uh, talk, uh, in fact, about this uh, free black community that uh, the Reverend Mr. Uh, Dr. Pritchard uh, uh, spoke about. And I'm going to tell you largely a story about African Americans, but I'm going to start at the very beginning. I'm going to talk a little bit about white people. And some people were a little bit disappointed in uh, reading my book that within the first 50 pages, uh, I dispense with the, the white story and shift mainly to uh, a black story. But that's the way the cookie crumbles, and that's the way it's going to be today. In 1796, a young Virginia planter, cousin of Thomas Jefferson, named Richard Randolph, sat down at his mahogany desk and did a very unusual thing for somebody of his age. He wrote a will. I don't know whether he anticipated an early death. If you read his will, it doesn't seem as though he did, although he proceeded to die rather promptly within a, a period of months. But this will of his is one of the most interesting documents, I think, in the, the whole panoply of American history, because the first half of the will doesn't really have anything to do with what he's leaving to his uh, wife and children. The first half of the will is an abolitionist uh, diatribe. It's uh, where Richard Randolph talks about how terrible slavery is and how regretful he is at having had any part in it. He had a part in it because his father left him 
uh, a large number of enslaved people, about 150. Richard Randolph inherited these people at the age of 21, and almost all of them had been mortgaged. You could mortgage a human being back then the same way we mortgage a house now. These people had been put up as collateral for loans, and they couldn't legally be freed until those loans were paid off. So this is the situation in which young Richard Randolph found himself, and I'm going to read you a sentence and a half from his will, keeping in mind that in those days they wrote long sentences. I'm quoting now. He writes, With an indignation too great for utterance at the tyrants of the earth, from the throned despot of a whole nation, to the more despicable but not less infamous petty tormentor of individual slaves, wretched slaves, whose torture constitutes his wealth and enjoyment, I do hereby dictate that it is my will and desire, nay, my most anxious wish, that my Negroes, all of them, be liberated. I thus yield them up their liberty, basely wrested from them by my forefathers and beg, humbly beg, their forgiveness for the manifold injuries I have too often inhumanly, unjustly, and mercilessly inflicted on them. Now, there's no evidence that Richard Randolph was a cruel master. He seems to have believed that the very act of owning other human beings was by no definition cruel, unusual, and inhuman. And to put him in a little bit of context, that was an unusual point of view in 1796, but not unique. His uh, Richard's stepfather, St. George Tucker, uh, shared that uh, belief. Richard's teacher, William and Mary, George With, shared that belief. Now here, we ought to draw a distinction. There were more than a few white Virginians who understood that slavery was wrong. Thomas Jefferson understood, understood slavery was wrong, but he never liberated anybody. Uh, he sold a fair number, but he didn't liberate anybody until his death, and then only people who were blood-related to him. Richard Randolph not only thought that slavery was, uh, was wrong, he believed that the, the races were equally endowed. They were literally created equal. He thought that, and his stepfather thought that, and George With thought that. And if the races are equally endowed by their creator, then there's no justification at all for slavery. So Randolph leaves this will, and he specifies that he's going to attempt in his lifetime to set free all of those people who, whom he has come to own. And if he dies first, he wants the debts to be paid off and his wife to see that these people go free. And not only that, but that they receive 400 acres of his land on which to settle. These are reparations. Reparations for a half a lifetime or a full lifetime of unremunerated labor. So he's going to provide them with land to settle on and the means to support themselves. That's very unusual. Uh, George Washington did a, a somewhat similar thing. He left a will uh, with uh, uh, provisions for freedom for, uh, for his uh, enslaved people and for economic help for them. But Richard Randolph went f uh, further even than, uh, than Washington. Now, Randolph, as I say, promptly died. And when he died, it took his wife, his widow, 14 years actually to set these people uh, free. Uh, partly because they were mortgaged and they couldn't legally be freed until those debts were paid off. And here, there's a, a, tragic, a tragic dimension because in order to pay off those debts, some of the enslaved people had to be sold off in order that the, other might, the others might eventually go free. Also, I think Richard's widow was less committed than he was to the idea of emancipation, but in the end, she was faithful to the vision, and in uh, Christmas, New Year's uh, season of 1810, 1811, she actually did 
set free about 95 enslaved people in Prince Edward County and uh, Cumberland County. And she carved out for them through 350 acres, it turned out, that was going to be their land on which they built a community. The name of the community, the name that was selected by the African-American settlers themselves was Israel Hill. And it is on a hill. You can go there today. Why Israel? I don't have any documentation of this, but I have not the least doubt that these uh, freed people, some of whom at least I know were devout Baptists, were invoking the story in the biblical book of Exodus of the delivery, the, the deliverance of the children of Israel from bondage in Egypt and their eventual arrival in the promised land. So this community of 350 acres, Israel Hill, was the promised land for the people uh, whom I'm going to be talking about for the rest of this uh, presentation. Now, as of 1811, these black Virginians were free. There's about 95 people, as I said. And what, did, what exactly did that mean? Well, it's, it was something far short of the freedom that white people enjoyed. If you were a free black person, you couldn't vote, you couldn't hold office, you couldn't serve on juries, you couldn't serve in the militia, you might have to pay certain taxes that white people didn't have to pay, you had to register with the county court and carry your registration papers uh, with you. You get the idea. It's something like a second or third class citizenship. But that doesn't mean that the freedom that these people had was devoid of meaning, because they did have the right to their own persons, the persons of their uh, their families, and unless uh, a free black person married a, a, an enslaved person, then there were complications that we'll talk about later. But basically, you own yourself. Uh, you could make your own decisions to a, a great degree. You could acquire property if you uh, obtained the means to do it. You could buy it, buy property, sell it, bequeath it to your children. Uh, you could do business. And to my surprise, I discovered you could even, uh, a free black person could even sue white people in the county court and more often than I thought, win these lawsuits. Now you couldn't testify in criminal court against a white defendant if you were black, but paradoxically you could sue, you could still file a civil suit against a white person. So you have a White, the right to own property, to multiply your property, to make money, uh, to be a free person and to file suits. And these are meaningful freedoms. And the reason I know they're meaningful is because I know what the black folk who had these freedoms did with them. My story, my black story, starts with a man named Hercules White, who was one of the first to be uh, uh, free and the most prominent within the black community of Israel Hill until his rather early death. He was a cooper, a carpenter, a hauler, a hauler of cargo, a, uh, a slaughter of hogs, an investor. Uh, white people owed him several hundred dollars at the time of his death in 1812. And his uh, children and grandchildren and other people of Israel Hill went on to become uh, important economic players in and around the town of Farmville. Members of the White family, White is their name, they're, they're black people, but their surname is White. Uh, uh, they uh, bought and sold at least 13 town lots in the town of Farmville. They buy a lot, they build buildings, uh, so that the property appreciated, then they sell it. They sell it at a profit. They uh, owned. Uh, th they went into a, a business uh, arrangements with white people. They borrowed money from white people. They lent money to white people. They ran boats up and down the Appomattox River. A lot of the cargo uh, traffic from uh, Piedmont, Virginia, down to the Tidewater in those days, 
was uh, carried along the, the rivers, the uh, uh, one of which you're uh, near the banks of right now, a lot of you. On the Appomattox River, the traffic was carried by uh, a type of boat called a bateau, a marvelous kind of craft. It was 50 to 60 feet long, only six feet wide. It could carry five to seven tons of cargo in uh, 20 to 22 inches of water. That's not much water. Uh, I've, I've seen bathtubs that were filled uh, fuller than that. The bateau was uh, run by a crew of three. There was a, a, a captain, as he was called, in the rear, uh, uh, wielding a, a tiller to stir with, and there were two, I mean, to steer with. There were uh, two other men, one on each side of the boat with a long pole, and they pushed the boat along with these poles. The 70 miles from Farmville to uh, Petersburg, where you could go with the current, and then they pushed the, the boat back 70 miles to Farmville. And I found that by 1850, something like 40% of the bateaus in Farmville, the running out of Farmville, were not only run by uh, free black people, but owned by free black people. This is serious entrepreneurship that's going on. Uh, I mentioned the right to sue white people. Why is that important? Well, it's important if a white person owes you a debt and doesn't want to pay you back, you have recourse. Even more important is the fact that, as I said, you can't testify in criminal court against a white defendant. And that means, suppose you're walking down the road one day and a white guy comes up and uh, uh, takes a poke at you. What is your recourse? You can't, uh, you can't bring criminal charges unless there's a white witness who's willing to testify. But what you can do, and what I found at least 19 free black people doing, is you can go to court and file a civil suit. And when black people did that, they were almost as likely to win their suits as white people were. Something that surprised me uh, a great deal. Another thing that surprised me is the, the degree of interaction between white and black people. I already talked about the business dealings, but I found that the First Baptist Church uh, that uh, was, was formed in Farmville, it was formed under the leadership of a white pastor, but the first two members to join were uh, Sam and Phil White, free black men of Israel Hill, promptly joined by about two dozen white people who apparently thought nothing uh, odd about joining a church that was, was founded uh, in large part by, uh, by black men. I found uh, people, uh, in, in one case, white and uh, free black people hitching up wagons and moving west together. I even found uh, white and black people settling down together as husband and wife. Now, by the 19th century, it wasn't legal in Virginia to marry across racial lines, but these were people who's, who were uh, de facto married, remained married for life, raised children and, uh, and, and grandchildren, and were occasionally interfered with, but for the most part were, uh, were left alone. Now, how was it possible that there was this degree of interaction between white and black people. Now here we, we, we have to issue a, a, a disclaimer, and that is that the, the freedoms that free black people did have, they, they had, in effect, by permission from, uh, from white people. It was a white-dominated system, a white supremacist system. So these are meaningful freedoms, but the freedoms exist because white people allow them uh, to exist. The question I just asked a moment ago was, how was it possible that there was this variety of interaction between uh, white and black people? Part of it has to do with shared values. I found that the black entrepreneurs and the white entrepreneurs uh, had similar value. They were all business. They liked money. They liked to make a profit. 
uh, they were looking for opportunities to make a profit. If you were a white guy and you could make money by uh, uh, dealing with a, a, a black man who owned a boat, you would do it. And if you were uh, a black fellow and you could, could make money in partnership with a white person, you would do it. They both were uh, driven by a work ethic uh, which they shared. They, they both, the enterprise of people of both races, looked down upon what they considered to be the idle people of their own race. So in a way, the white businessman and the black businessman had more in common than either had with the, what they would have called the riffraff of their own race. The same is true in the church where white and black people worshiped together. Now they, they uh, had segregated seating in there, but as I said, the Baptist church was co-founded by white and black people. Both uh, white and black people, when they uh, converted and uh, presented themselves for baptism, had to uh, narrate for the, the congregation their conversion experience. And the conversion experience of a black person and uh, that of a, a white person were considered to be equally valid. The uh, religious life was complicated uh, in a way that I hadn't anticipated, which is that I found that there, were, there was a certain uh, fad among uh, young men to harass religious worshipers. They'd shoot guns off outside the church, they would threaten uh, worshipers uh, at, at times, and all of the people who I found doing this were young white men. And I came to realize that the black Baptist, the free black or enslaved black Baptist sitting in that church and the white Baptist sitting in that church are both threatened by these ruffians, these white ruffians outside, and they have far more in common with one another, infinitely more than they have with the uh, the, the white people have nothing in common at all with those, uh, those white people outside who are harassing them and their black uh, 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 brethren and uh, sisters in the church. Uh, I, I found also there were a lot of white people who were only barely literate. And when they tried to write something down, they wrote English the way they spoke English. And I came to understand that the way a lot of white people spoke back then and the way they kept time and the way that they understand the, they understood the seasons of the year were very similar to the way uh, 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 black people did all of those things. The idea that there's, there's some kind of uh, a, a divide between black and white culture existed back then, but the divide was not understood to be as broad as it is now. So you have all of these interactions between white and black, you have uh, free black people facing restrictions that are very important and also having freedoms that are very important. And you start to think, well, maybe this society wasn't as bad as we thought. Yes, it was. You go through the record at least I did. I thought I knew a lot about slavery. I've been uh, studying it and teaching about it professionally for 20 years when I started researching this book, and, and, and even I was uh, at times shocked. You uh, find something I already knew. Frederick Douglass tells, the, tells us this in his uh, uh, memoirs, that the thing that uh, the enslaved person feared the most most of the time was the death of the master, even if the master was an awful, cruel person, because that master dies, or for that matter, that master goes bankrupt. And the people he owned get cast to the four winds. Families get separated. Children from, from parents, I've seen children as young as six or five or even four, removed from their uh, parents. And I don't care how benevolent the master thinks he is, if he dies, uh, with, without any money. The people he owns, as I say, are going to be cast to the four winds. So you find in 1842 a uh, sheriff's auction in uh, Buckingham Courthouse, Virginia, where the uh, sheriff is auctioning off the property of a bunch of white people who have died uh, 
essentially bankrupt. And of course, a lot of that property consists of human beings. And so, in uh, two days, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm finding uh, 120 black human beings are sold off through no fault of their own, needless to say, because their masters are bankrupt. And the record shows that most of them were boys and girls. So that shows how cruel a system could be, even when somebody wasn't trying to be cruel. And that's before we get to the fact that Virginia was the great supplier of enslaved human beings to the cotton states. The internal slave trade out of Virginia, the number of people sold out of here is in, uh, I, I don't have an exact figure, but it, it's, it, it, it could be a million people. People, uh, uh, again, family separated, people going down, uh, uh, being sent down to, uh, to pick cotton under uh, uh, pretty brutal uh, conditions. One more anecdote, if you want to call it that. In 1861, the Civil War had just started, in an oak field just outside of Farmville, an enslaved man, a young man named William, was harvesting with some of his uh, fellow slaves. And he took a wheat cradle. That's like a great big scythe, you know, like the Grim Reaper, Reaper is pictured as, as carrying, and basically cut off one of the legs of, of his master, a man named Hillary G. Richardson. And of course, William was apprehended and put on trial for murder, on trial for his life. What happened at the trial was, there was testimony, abundant testimony, from white people and slave black people, all saying the same thing, which is that William, the defendant, had been brutalized. He had lacerations all over his body. His eyes had been gouged uh, with a stick by his master. He had been beaten from head to toe by the same stick, he had been chained to the floor while he slept, his master Richardson had taken pliers and pulled teeth out of William's mouth. Apparently, just for the the, the sadistic uh, 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 thrill of doing it, I mean, it's it's horrific, unbelievable stuff. And again, white and black people are both testifying to this. And in fact, there's no there's no way that William was going to be acquitted in Virginia in 1861. But his life was spared. The, the charge was uh, was bumped down to second degree murder. In a fair system, he would have been acquitted on grounds of self defense. But even even white slaveholders weren't willing to take this man's life after what had happened to him. But the problem here is Hillary Richardson had a reputation as a brutal master. Everybody knew he was a, a barbarian. And had known it for years, and yet Richardson had served on the county court. He had served as county sheriff, and nobody ever said a word against him until he was uh, lying in the grave. So, if you want evidence, and I know you don't need the evidence that the system was irredeemable, that human body is irredeemable, there it is. And when people come to me and say, "Well, my ancestors uh, were were kind to their slaves." What I think is, number one, you don't know uh, whether they were or not, but let's, let's suppose that they were. They were still part of a system that allowed the kind of uh, brutality that I'm talking about and a kind of system that routinely, even if it was at times involuntary, involuntary broke, up, uh, broke up families. So what I have to do as a historian is I have to walk a kind of tightrope where, on the one hand, I want to talk about the cultural similarities between white and African-American people in the Old South. I want to talk about the surprising array of relations that existed among white and black people. I've found things that I think most people don't know about the way that system operated, and I want to tell them about those things. And yet I have to do it without allowing people any latitude at all to start thinking, well, maybe the system wasn't that bad. 
I'm dealing in nuance here. I'm talking about a system that was that bad. And at the same time, uh, it was inhabited by human beings who had a variety of relationships that you would expect in a community of uh, thousands of, of human beings. That's the paradox. And when people say to me, well, you know, slavery was bad, but the people who uh, uh, participated in it didn't really understand that it was wrong. My response is that my research shows that people of each race recognize the humanity of the other. Every single day, they engaged in interactions that showed that they regarded the other as a human being. And yet, even in a society where you regard the other as human, you have one group of people, members of one group holding the other group as property with all the implications that that bears. And I've told you what some of the implications are. So I'm telling the story that's complicated and not everybody wants complexity. I'm hoping that some of you do uh, because that's all I've got to offer. And I'm going to close this part of my remarks before we go to questions and answers by just telling you that I'm about halfway through writing my next book and in a way, it's a sequel to Israel on the Appomattox, because what I'm doing in this book is I'm talking, in Israel on the Appomattox, I'm talking about relations between uh, white people and African Americans who are already free uh, before the Civil War. In the coming book, which I'm going to call A Horrible Intimacy, I'm talking about relations between white people and enslaved African Americans, which was 95% of the people in Prince Edward County and most parts of uh, Virginia, 95% of the black population was enslaved. And I'm talking about master-slave relations, and I'm talking about overseer-slave relations, and I'm talking uh, also about relations between uh, white people who didn't own slaves at all and uh, the enslaved uh, uh, folk. That's where I'm going next. I'm writing it actually in the form almost of a screenplay. And we'll see whether that works. But the reason I'm doing it that way is that I think that what we have here is a history that is full of drama, is full of tragedy, is full of sadness, is full of black achievement. And that's, uh, that's a major takeaway here. It's what people of African descent were able to accomplish in spite of all the obstacles that we've talked about. I'm trying to tell a human story here, and I think uh, I'm going to stop talking now. Thank you very much. Well, Professor Ely, thank you so much. And uh, I, I want to start with a question of my own and then see if we've got some other uh, questions. Um, and I think we've got some, um, we, we do have some questions on the line. But I'm, I just want to start about one local reference here. Uh, in the 1790s, Robert Carter III of Lancaster County, which is um, the, the county just north of Middlesex on the other side of Rappahannock, uh, was uh, left a will in which he emancipated 500 people. And uh, it, it's my impression, I may be wrong, that the, the two stories, we uh, that story and the story that you tell, may be the largest number of people liberated uh, in uh, Antebellum, Virginia. Uh, so my question is, were you able to discover any connection um, between the two, other than uh, sort of sharing in the same general culture? I don't know of any, uh, I didn't find any specific connection, except that uh, they're both they're both Randolphs, right? But then every, every third Virginian was a Randolph back then, so that doesn't necessarily prove anything. Uh, you're right about the... the uh, uh, 
I mean, uh, uh, Carter, you know, he has the surname Carter, but they are, they are some kind of remotely blood related. Uh, Carter's main mission, I think, was the, the largest by dent of numbers in, in uh, Virginia. Uh, the, the the Washington Magnum mission was bigger than uh, uh, bigger than Richard Randolph's, and, and there were few others who who uh, would rival in, uh, in in terms of numbers. I'm not aware of any connection between uh, Robert Carter and uh, uh, Richard Randolph, except I assume they had they had similar uh, motives. There's a book about uh, about the Carter uh, mining mission uh, by a guy named uh, I think it's Andrew Levy. So that's that's out there too for anybody who wants to read about it. And of course, that's the family that uh, that that uh, built the fabulous uh, Christ Church, right? Which is uh, yeah, which is well worth a visit. I'm sure many of you, many of the people in this gathering have been there. But if you haven't, you should go go out there and have a look. Okay. Um, my second question is, um, which has been uh, uh, sent to me, is: Does the Israel Hill, the Israel Hill community, still exist in the 21st century? If so, what is it like? Is there a group of Israel Hill descendants in Prince Edward today? Okay. The the. Israel on Israel Hill does not exist anymore. Uh, but, uh, actually, when I started working on this book, there was one family still up there whom, whom I inter interviewed in their own house. So they're not there anymore. But there is a community of Israel Hill descendants whom I interviewed for this book. And uh, I interviewed, in fact, uh, two uh, women who were rather elderly at the time who had grown up on Israel Hill, and their pictures. Uh, and their stories actually appear in my book. Now, about the Israel Hill uh, descendants, a few years back, a uh, Virginia Highway historical marker was, was set up at the site of Israel Hill, and we had a dedication ceremony there. And the descendants of the Israel Hill people turned out in very large numbers. I'm pretty sure we had 150 people out there that day probably two-thirds of whom told me that they were uh, descendants. So they, uh, yeah, they're, they're still going strong. I talked to one gentleman who said that he grew up in Farmville, but he used to walk up the railroad tracks to, his, to, to stay with his relatives on Israel Hill every weekend, and that was up into the 1940s. Uh, what happened then was that uh, a lot of black folk from uh, Virginia were moving north to get jobs. They were moving to Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York, and so on, Boston. And the, the population just, just thinned out and dwindled on, on Israel Hill to the point where there was no longer a black community up there. But the memory lives on for sure. Thank you. Um. I am. In, I would encourage others to, to post questions, and uh, I have another one I wanted to ask. I, I have heard. Um, I have in the last month was at a or heard a presentation when someone said, kind of cavalierly without explanation, that promises to release people from captivity in wills were easily made and also easily defeated. So that in some cases the promises were made and heirs and others and the court overturned those promises. So I, I, I take it that um, Judith um, did something, the, the widow um, did something uh, significant when she followed through. Can you, can you tell us a little bit more about her own connection and background? Well, first, let me confirm that uh, you're you're right about the the heirs wanting to uh, defeat these wills because uh, if you think about it, you're a, a, a white uh, heir, and uh, this will is read, and the the will is is calling for the uh, the the freeing of ten people, twenty people, thirty people. And, and that's the main form of, of property, and under the law it was property that you were going to inherit. So you're going to lose out there. And there was rarely a will uh, 
uh, that attempted to set black folk free that white heirs didn't contest. In fact, Richard Randolph's own brother, the rather famous John Randolph of Roanoke, left a will in which he uh, called for some 300 people to be freed, and that will was tied up in court by his heirs for, uh, for 10 years. They were contending he wasn't in his right, right mind when he wrote it. Finally, the will was upheld and the people went free, and he left money, by the way, for them to be transported to the free state of, of uh, Ohio. And they were transported there, and when they got off the, the riverboat, the white people of that part of Ohio were there to tell them, no, they were not going to settle there. So the white prejudice was, was about as bad up there as it was in Virginia, and those people were scattered. And uh, until a few years ago, they were still trying to get restitution for that. So that's why Judith Randolph really turned out to be kind of a stand-up character here, because instead of contesting the will, she actually carried it out. And she had two surviving sons who could have profited. Uh, she had to move into a small house. Her, she, her way of life, her lifestyle, if you want, really uh, had to be ratcheted down because of this. And yet, just to show you how pervasive slavery was, when Judith moved into this smaller house and freed all these folk, she turned around and bought uh, four, four or five uh, uh, enslaved people herself to take care of her house. She, t she still couldn't wrap her mind around the idea that she, that she could have a, a slavery-free uh, existence. Hey, uh, another... was, uh, no, that's a, no, no, I'm, 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 I'm done, I think. Thank you. Um, one of the questions we've been asked is, where did you obtain your main primary sources for this work? For your book? Okay. Uh, almost all of my sources are the county court records of Prince Edward County, which, unlike a lot of counties in Virginia, those records were, were beautifully preserved. They never burned. Uh, the, the, uh, they were never uh, lost, they never uh, deteriorated. It's a wonderful set of records that are held in this, the Library of Virginia in Richmond. And here you have to understand the county court was not just, a, and not even mainly a court of law, the county court was the governing body of the county. So anything and everything that went on in that county, uh, or, or anytime anybody sued anybody, uh, all of those records are there. So uh, let's say, Billy sues uh, 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 Sammy. Uh, in that lawsuit, Billy tells his whole story in writing, and then Sammy tells his whole side of the story in writing. And and some of those litigants are, are, are black folk who were essentially denied uh, the right to, to learn to read and write, but they tell their stories in court. So you have uh, 80 cartons or whatever it is of uh, records from pre-Civil War uh, Virginia uh, County Court, and that was my source. And, and a few interviews, as I say, with people who grew up on Israel Hill in the post-Civil uh, War era. An another question, you pointed out that the Israel Hill community no longer exists today. Mm. Um, what were the, Israel, uh, the, the Israelites, the members of the community, able to hold on to their real estate uh, in the years after the Civil War, or was yes. this a late 20th century, uh, mid-20th century phenomenon that they lost the property? No, they, they, hold, they held on to it, and I, I, I don't know for certain, but I, I don't think that they necessarily lost, lost their land through uh, uh, some uh, calamities or something in the 20th century. I think, I think some probably sold, and and sold out and moved moved on or moved on and then sold maybe maybe some uh, uh, loss to foreclosure or something I don't I, I just don't know I don't think they were run off of there I just think that the great migration happened and, and the population thinned. Thank you. Are there I think we're getting to the, you, you've got some compliments here that are coming in the, the chat box thanking you for the presentation and a uh, um, a promise to buy a copy of the book, and the, the, the last slide that I will show will be one that shows the uh, where you can buy the book, and uh, so people will, will have that information. It's uh, available in electronic and paper form 
um, and, and Amazon uh, still thinks they can uh, uh, get it to people in time for a Christmas present. Okay, great. Okay. Um, when do you expect your next book to be published? Well, uh, if God is gracious, I will finish writing it in the year 2021, and then it'll probably take a year to, in, in, in production to come out. Thank you. If there are others with question, ah, um, here, uh, other questions are, are coming. Um, I'm always curious about how free black how freely black people were able to move around and you have mentioned people moving to the west for example relocating yeah uh, to places where the israel hill community would not have been known yeah well um, the mobility uh, physical mobility of free black people and, and enslaved black people was uh, in principle, it was it was restricted. I mean, if, if you were a slave and somebody owned you, then you were supposed to have permission of your master to move about. If you were free, a free black person, uh, there were uh, there were laws against moving from one county to another without uh, without uh, permission, or uh, free black people moving from other states into Virginia without permission. Now, in reality. Those laws were kind of intermittently enforced. Uh, I found a lot of uh, a lot of mobility, a lot of uh, black folks from other counties moving into Prince Edward, and people from Prince Edward moving out of there. Now, if if white people, if some white person at some point wanted to enf enforce, that always existed. It's a threat in the background, but there was really a lot of mobility on slave people. If you were a slave, you were supposed to have a written pass to leave your master's land. And the fact is most masters were too, what, distracted or lazy to bother with that. So there was a lot of mobility, a lot of moving around, especially at night, so that spouses could visit their spouse. You know, a man and a, a, a woman who are, or a husband and wife live on different plantations. You, you would go try to visit your family, or you would go and uh, maybe in your, in your off hours, you, uh, you made shoes or something like that. You'd go out and, and, and trade at night. Now again, if a slave patrol came along and wanted to ask for passes and you didn't have one, they could whip you. But a lot of the time, there was a, a, a pretty fair amount of, of mobility, unless, of course, you tried to escape. And then the, the, the odds of, of getting away to a free state were almost negligible. In um, Williamsburg, it was the case that if somebody who um, wanted to, to punish an enslaved person uh, was squeamish about doing it, you could get the the county to administer punishment. Yeah. Uh, so so their records of, it, it results in a set of records about who was being beaten and who was asking people to yeah. be flogged. Uh, was that the case in Prince Edward County also? I, I didn't I didn't find that there. But of course, the, the the overseer performs a function, something like that. If you're a big enough uh, property holder that you have an overseer, one of the reasons people had overseers was is if they were squeamish about inflicting physical punishment, they could hire somebody who wasn't squeamish. And I'm saying, by the way, in the chat that uh, the follow-up to that question about mobility, somebody's asking whether if. Uh, his or her ancestors live in one county, might they be related to a family in an adjacent county? Emphatically, yes. That's very possible. Yes. And you yeah. see uh, the, the further question about entrepreneurs? Yeah. Um, well, the, the entrepreneurs, uh, they, they would live in... Um, well, not not uh, sumptuous surroundings, but they, they, they would uh, live in a good, good respectable uh, house of, that a, a person of, of middling income would probably have. Now, there were in the state of Virginia, and even more so in certain other states, 
South Carolina, uh, Louisiana especially, free people of color who were actually wealthy. Uh, none of those were in Prince Edward County, but uh, uh, Goochland, Buckingham, there were uh, several very well-to-do free black families. Of course, they're the exception that proved the rule. Thank you. Uh, at this point, if there's anyone who would like to unmute themselves and uh, to uh, a direct a question directly to Professor Ely, I think we have a little bit of time to do that. Uh, so, you, um, But I would ask you, after you have asked your question, if you would you please mute yourself again, uh, because lots of open microphones do create some trouble with bandwidth and the possibility of others uh, others hearing what is said. But are there any, uh, uh, would anyone like to ask? I have a follow-up question. This is Patricia Satchfield, who badly typed the last question concerning the entrepreneurs. I do know how to spell them or not, but my fingers don't know how to input it. But I didn't even notice that. My question was more addressed to those members of the uh, community who were not Entrepreneurs. Okay. The oh, the typical. Oh, uh, the typical life. I, I see. I misread the question. Yeah, the typical life uh, of. Um, okay, there, there's the the free black folk who had uh, land, and that's true of the people of Israel Hill. They they would have lived, most of them, uh, modestly, but uh, with 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 adequate. Uh, surroundings, adequate appointments and so forth. But the majority of free black folk uh, worked for white people. And that meant that they would live uh, very probably among the enslaved population of whatever white person they uh, worked for. And those were uh, what you call minimalist accommodations. You know, that's a roof over your head and uh, uh, four four walls and a certain amount of, of, of food, but it was uh, a kind of Spartan uh, existence. That's that's the way a, a great many uh, free black people would have lived. And then it got to be where uh, th there was industry growing up in Farmville, the tobacco uh, 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 manufacturing uh, industry, even before the Civil War. And at that point, you started getting uh, whole neighborhoods of free African Americans and enslaved African Americans who were hired out living in neighborhoods together in uh, rented rented quarters near the factories that they worked in. And I don't know a lot about those accommodations, but I would think that those were quite uh, modest. I mean, not, uh, not at all uh, luxurious. Uh, I see there's a related question about the income and lifestyles and so forth. Did free black people have slaves? And the answer is, yes, yeah, some of them did. The majority of those who owned enslaved people actually owned members of their own family. They, they would buy, let's say a free black person would uh, marry or choose as a spouse someone who was enslaved and they would buy that, that person. Uh, so that uh, the white uh, master would no longer control that person. And then they might not legally set that person free uh, because there was a law that said that any uh, black person who was freed in Virginia after 1806 could be required to leave the state. And that was almost never uh, enforced, but if you want to be real careful, you might keep your spouse and or your children technically as your property. Now there were free African Americans who, who bought enslaved people for the same reason white people did, which is to make money. Uh, that was relatively rare in Virginia. It was not uncommon in Louisiana. questions here. Uh, 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 there's one about whether uh, Randolph knew about Carter's manumission. I'm trying to remember the uh, chronology of that. I think I think the Carter 
Robert Hart was first, and he also was a young man when he, uh, I think 1791, uh, was his manumission. 91, okay. So I don't know, I don't know whether, I, 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 don't, I can't imagine Randolph not knowing. You know, if, Car if Carter were forced and it were, it were that big a, a manumission, I, I suspect that uh, uh, everybody in Virginia knew about it, I'm guessing. Uh, but figuring out who enslaved his or her ancestors, uh, how might how might you discover who the 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 enslavers were? And you know that's the type of thing. Uh, beside a white, uh, really ought to answer that because she's uh, she has a African American genealogical society, and, and uh, she knows she'll run rings around me on that question. I know it's difficult to do, but there are ways. There may be ways for you to do that. Well, I have a, a, a general question, and um, but that will be about the premise of a first emancipation. That is, that's the title of a book of about twenty years ago. But it, it talks about the period between seventeen seventy five and 1808 as america's first emancipation is the period of time in which northern states that abolished slavery did so though in some cases they adopted laws that took 20 years to uh, come to completion uh, by giving people their freedom when they reached an age of 25 or 30 some additional age do, do, do you see such events as israel hill as a kind of Virginia's participation in that general spirit of um, people did apparently notice the, uh, the incongruity of claiming that the British were despots for not giving rights to Americans while holding despotically other people in enslavement. Right. And so was there a kind of window in which people, uh, was this just a case of a couple of extraordinary people or are we in a period of time uh, after the revolution, when revolutionary ideas strike people's minds, and there, was, there was a period uh, after the revolution in in Virginia where uh, there was a fairly widespread feeling among influential people that it was incongruous to hold people in slavery, having just uh, rebelled against. Not only rebelled against Great Britain, but if you read the language of the Declaration of Independence, or the, the patriotic language of the time, the allegation was that King George III was enslaving Americans. Uh, Patrick Henry talked about uh, never submit to the, the bonds or chains, of, the chains of slavery. So they were even using the language. And that's why in 1782, one year after the Battle of Yorktown, the Virginia legislature passed for the first time a law allowing individual slave owners to free enslaved people. Before that, it had to, you had to have an act to the legislature to free a black person from slavery. Now the legislature said any individual who's moved by conscience or whatever can, can set uh, people free. And it was under that law that Richard Randolph was uh, operating. So yeah, there's a, there's a period like that where there's a feeling of unease about slavery. And then, uh, but there are always people who are arguing against this. There are always white people who are saying, no, slavery is good, we ought to hold on to it. And they argue back and forth for years. And finally in 1806, they, they reach a compromise. And the compromise is, yes, white people can still set enslaved people free, but if they do that, the newly freed people are supposed to leave the state within one year. So the hardliners got the expulsion clause, and the ones who, who wanted, who still had qualms about slavery, got the right to uh, to manage that people. And as you point out in your book, um, in effect, Israel Hill was a grandfather because the the will that set them free predated that eighteen six. Right, and and for that to happen, the local white authorities had to be had to be. Willing. I mean, it was basically the county court decided that uh, that Israel Hill was was exempt from the expulsion clause because the will that 
The second three had been written before 1806, exactly. Well, I, I thank you for asking the questions. Do you have any final comment or summing up? Uh, or um, My summing up is that uh, I, I, I love talking to and listening to, even if it's only through the chat box, uh, intelligent, engaged people, and I've I've had that in abundance here. So I, I'm just so thankful to everyone who has uh, attended, and uh, certainly to those who have organized this. It's my great privilege to have been here. And it is our privilege to have uh, uh, to have been um, listeners to you today. We appreciate it very much. We uh, apologize that you were not able to come to Middlesex County and meet us uh, in person. Uh, or renew friendships in person. Um, one of the things that this local area is known for in Middlesex County is our oysters. And uh, we have a small token of thanks for your speaking to us today. And I understand that uh, even as I talk, the side of white will hit a button and you will be sent a gift certificate uh, for rapid, for the from the local oyster company um, Rappahannock Oyster Company will uh, uh, sell gift certificates, and we have one coming to you. Uh, and we hope as you uh, enjoy those oysters, you will think.